Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Um, we are continuing our shiur on the tefillah, and we are in the middle of discussing the Pesuke de Zimra. So just to recap where we're holding exactly, we first discussed in the first shiur the origins of the Pesuke de Zimra, the ancient origins, which occur first after the destruction of the Second Temple, when the newest forms of liturgy were being composed, and we find then a <clears throat> we found then when we studied this topic, we found a beginning of the idea of saying verses of song in the morning before prayers begin in the time of the Tanaim and then evolve into the time of the Amoraim. We saw that it evolved into two branches: the Talmud Bavli's branch, sorry, the, the Bavli branch and the Ushami branch. And we then, in the next class, we studied the medieval development of Pesuket Zimra, And we noted how difficult the medieval uh, study, the study of medieval Pesuket Zimra was, simply because we don't have many textual witnesses of the Pesuket Zimra of that time. When, whether it's early medieval or late medieval Pesuket Zimra, we simply don't have a lot of good evidence. First of all, because before the turn of the millennium, before the year 1000, Pesuket Zimra was a private practice. And then after the, the turn of the millennium, most of our, I'm going to let Gary in here. And then after the turn of the millennium, most of our evidence of the Pesuket Zimra is scant, confusing, and fragmentary in nature. And whether it's a Siddur, a Halacha Sefer, a manuscript, whatever we had from the late medieval time was at best leaving us guessing as to the true nature of what they would say both in private and in public in medieval times. So the theory I posited last week when studying the medieval sections were the parts of Sukkot Zimra to clarify the parts of Sukkot Zimra that were added in medieval time. My, the theory I posited last week was that as there was a transition but from saying Pesuket de Zimra in private past the year 1000 where people started saying Pesuket de Zimra in public, there was a period of confusion between what should be said and during Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh and what should be said during the weekday. Because originally, <clears throat> people would only hear Pesuket de Zimra in the shul when they went to the shul on a holiday or on Shabbat or on Rosh Chodesh, etc. <clears throat> and so since their reference for Pesuket de Zimra and what you should say on, during Pesuket de Zimra was from when the, they went to shul and heard Pesuket de Zimra in shul, which is usually only on holidays, therefore, when they started doing it on weekdays as well, a lot of people use those Pesuket de Zimra as their reference point, even though it was incorrect. Some people just didn't have the mentors to teach them that certain Pesuket de Zimra were said only on uh, weekdays and not on holidays. Like, for example, a good example would be Hashemai Misaprim Kavod Kel or uh, Mizmar Latoda. <clears throat> it is very likely, just from the evidence we see in the Rishonim of the medieval period, uh, that especially in the early and earlier times, like the 12th century and 11th century, it's very likely just from the halachas they construct and their attestations as to how it was performed it's very likely that this came from a confusion as to what is said in the weekday and what is said on the holiday. So that was what we worked with last week. And we went through many of the additions to Pesuket de Zimra that were added uh, to the core six, right? The core six from Tehillah the David until the end, from Kuf Memhe until the end of Tehillim, which is Kuf Nun. So that's what we worked on last week. Some of those famous additions, for example, are the litany of verses in, in Yehi Chavod Hashem Olam. Or Mizbah uh, Latoda, we had Vayvarech David and Az Yashir and Hodul Hashem Kirubishmo, and many other additions to the Pesuket de Zimra. Tonight, um, I want to first fill in one gap from what we left off last week, and one or two gaps, and then I want to continue with some of the modern evidence. So, First, to fill in a gap. I, I felt like I forgot something last week, and we, we really ran out of time, but I did actually forget to mention one more prot uh, when it comes to medieval editions, and that is that the testimony that we have for how Azusha became part 
of the of the Pesukim Zimra liturgy is is a little bit scattered, but we do have a tshuva from Rav Natsu Naigaon, where he says that you know in the yeshivas we don't say az yashir. We heard some people say it; it's a nice mitig, but you know, and we're not meicha. We, we don't protest people who are going to add shira sayam to uh, to the Pesuk de Zimra. That's a very early source. That's roughly from the ninth century. Somebody saying that he heard that one of the ra- great rabbis claiming that he heard that, Pesuk- that people were adding Az Yashir to Pesuk- de Zimra. However, there's one more source, and this source comes from the Siddur HaRakeach, where Rabbi Lazar HaRakeach, at a certain point in Vaivarech David, he tells over a very, he, he gives an introduction there, which is historically extremely important. All of the scholars who study early German Jewish history um, reference this part in the Machzor HaRokeach, which is also copied from a few other, copied in a few other places. And the Rokeach essentially gives an introduction to why he wrote this book, and why did he write this Siddur, uh, this Pirush al He gives a personal history, and he gives a family history, and he gives a rabbinical history of the, of the tradition of this commentary and these secrets, so to speak, of, of the words of the Tzvila. And what he does is that he mentions the history of how the Jewish scholars, the Jewish rabbis, and the Jewish families got to Germany from Italy. And again, this is an extremely important passage for the history of it. And the short, the short story is that sometime in the 10th or 9th, uh, possibly early 9th century, one of the, the Charlemagne, one of the um, Carolinian kings, whether it was Charlemagne or Charles the Bald, one of the French kings wanted to legitimate his empire. His empire. And you legitimate your empire by having universities and scholars and and officials and ministers and finance ministers. And because he uh, needed to legitimate his his empire, he imported scholars of all types, especially Jews. Um, And the Jewish scholars that he imported were the uh, famously the the many of the scholars of the Colonimus family. And there were other scholars as well, but those were the, uh, th- that was the, the famous family, one of the, one of the handful of famous families that came in. And they came as translators and as financiers and uh, et cetera. And they, they were imported from Italy, from Southern Italy, from Lombardy into Northern Germany and the Northern part of the Rhine, of the Rhine River. That was the beginning of the, of the so-called Holy Roman Empire. Now, these early scholars the earliest Jews of Germany were very much Italian. They identified as Italians and they were heavily impacted, uh, heavily influenced or what other traditions were heavily Italian. And sometimes they, t- they tell us in passing what they did in Italy or how they did it in Italy or, you know, what their Misora was in Italy. So one of those things that they mention is mentioned there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the city of the Rokeach. He mentions that the rabbis in Italy, specifically of Moshe Barclonimus, one of the rabbis in Italy met somebody named Abu Aharon. Abu Aharon Habavli. Abu Aharon Habavli was a person who was apparently the son of someone named Shmuel Hanasi. And Shmuel Hanasi was clearly a dignitary, a dignified president of the community in Bavel. And his son was sent into exile for some reason. Historians debate exactly why this happened, but it's quite likely that he made a bid for the Gonate and it went very badly. Whatever the case is, he was forced to exile from Bavel and he had to go wandering. And he ended up in Lombardy and he was a scholar. And according to the tradition of the Hasidic Ashkenaz, he taught all of the secrets of the Tfila tour of Moshe Barclonimus. And there is also in the Megillat Achimatz, and we've mentioned this, if you look back in the Shurim to the Italian family, I did mention the scroll of Achimatz. And in there, there's also a couple of stories about him. He's not just a legendary figure. He was actually, they, they have legendary stories about him, but he was also a real human that existed. And one of the things that he told them was that in Bavel, this is how we do it. And you're supposed to add Vaivarech David and Az Yashir into the Pesuket de Zimra, up until the point, I think it was, Hashem uh, Echad so this is a ninth century uh, witness to the customs in Bavel that there were people in Bavel saying Az Yashir and Mevarach David. And from there, from, from southern Italy, via, by message through uh, Bavel, we have the custom coming to the Ashkenazim that the Ashkenazim also say Mevarach David 
and does yashir during davening. It's a fascinating uh, transition or a fascinating uh, uh, chain of tradition that goes from one uh, that goes from one generation to another. Now, if we're going to what's it called? If we're going to study the now that now that I just covered some of that homework, if we're going to study the modern period, what you'll notice is that much of the history of the modern period in studying tefillah, much of that history is much better documented than what we were looking at them in medieval times. Simply put, the printing press was the greatest information revolution until the internet. And the explosion of information and the explosion of, of halachic works and, and sidurim in the Jewish world means that we just have so much information, so much better information about what exactly and how exactly different additions to the Pesuket de Zimra were added. Now, there aren't that many of these additions to Pesuket de Zimra, and therefore the ones that do exist or are, um, the ones that do exist or are, um, well, how, do I, how do I say this? Um, or a thought to, to be from the modern era, are what we're going to discuss tonight. Now, give me a second. I just have to um, zoom the share. Hold up. Okay. So one of those things, for, for just as a good example, for just as a good example, for what I mean by bibliographic data, is that if you look at some of the earliest printed Sidurim, you can find from the Sidurim not just information about what we said, or why we said it, but also about how the Jews thought about certain tefillos. So take, for example, a section like Hashem Kel Nekamot Hofiah. This is a section at the end of Hodu. And if you look in modern Sidurim, many of the, I should say contemporary Sidurim, Sidurim from today, if you look at the Kel Nekamot Hashem section, it's usually a run-on section from Hodu Lashem Kiru Bishmo. But if you look at the earlier Sidurim, and I'm going to try to share my screen here, uh, properly hold up let's see if i can if i can uh find it fast enough give me a second here we go Mahsur, let's do let's do this sitter from 1490 here's here's just a sitter from 1490 which was published in naples uh was actually this version this is the later version from 1524 but here you go and at the end here you see at the end of hotu they separate kelnakamot hashem kelnakamot hofia just by looking at these 10 psukim as a separate unit you realize that the jews in the 1490s considered this addition to hodu lashem kirubishmo to be a later addition and a separate rubric from hodu lashem so that's a fascinating thing why is that the case even though we find kelnakamot hashem in a much earlier, in much earlier sources, we find it in, in Gaonic sources. Still, they consider this rubric of ten psukim to be a separate unit. The consequences of this psychology is that you also see, in let's say in the Svarim of the of the Mikubalim, like the Arizal and Shar Kavanos, that they designate ten special Kavanos to each one of these psukim, and the Mikubalim say that each one of these psukim is is a a tikkun for another one of the Asar Ruge Malchus, and each one of the Asar Ruge Malchus performed his own tikkun for, for bringing up different incisions like Dusha, and each one of these psukim uh, harkens from that power. So just looking at not just what's in the sitter, but also how the sitter is typeset can very often tell you a lot about how um, how they thought about a tefillah and why the thought of tefillah developed in the way that it did. Sometimes if, if people think that this rubric is an independent rubric, it's going to get treated and studied as an independent rubric. Now, one of the earliest um, tefillahs that was considered modern, one of the most classic ones that everybody considers a modern edition, is Tehillim Perek Lamed, which is Mizvar Shir Chanukah Sabayis David Aramim Chashem Kidili Sani. So, if you look in the study of Ismar Elbogen, who wrote the uh, Jewish Liturgy Comprehensive Guide, Already in the 1930s, he's like, oh, this doesn't end up, end up in the Sidurim until the 17th century. This is a very new thing. And I looked in the Sidur, uh, and he says the same thing. Look, if you look at all the Sidurim, nobody has this. This is a brand new edition. 
in the uh, the Sidurim from the 17th century. We don't know who or why decided to put in our Imam Hashem Kedil Sani after Haidu, but this is very much a recent addition, and there are those who don't say it, and um, especially people who follow the Gra, Ashkenazim. Plenty of people don't say this 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 Mizmar, and um, it's 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 a very recent addition. But as I was looking at, as I was looking around, I noticed that in the Masifta, uh, in the Masifta. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Siddur. They were like, no, hold on, wait a second. If you look at the, if you look at the Siddur that was published in Naples in 1490, you would see that they did have Arimim Chashem Kedil Sunny. And I'm just going to share my screen to show it to you right now. Uh, here we go. If you look here, this is published 200 something years before Elbogen claims. Boom! You have Arimim Chashem right after Haidu. We have Arimim Chashem Kidil Sani Vilaisimach Toiv Ali as the whole parak, with uh, excluding the Mizmar in the in the beginning. Now, for those people who claim that this was only added by the Mikubalim, the Arizal wasn't born until 1534. So you can't say the Arizal told people to add in Arimim Chashem Kidil Sani if we have this in a sitter from 1490. It just is impossible. But I did a little bit more digging, and I noticed that this ends up in one more place. Hold up, I just need to be able to, to move to move Chrome a little bit lower. Uh, everybody loves computers. Hold on. Here we go. I hope I'm still sharing the screen. If you if you actually dig and you look at some of the earliest Sfaradi Sidurim we have, one of the earliest Sfaradi Sidurim we have is a Bodleian copy from the early 1300s. This is sitting in the in the Oxford Bodleian collection. And it's cataloged as Neubauer 1133. This is a beautiful Siddur, and it's really important for the study of the Sephardic Castilian Nusach. But smack right there, in the early 1300s, you have, right after Haidul Hashem Kiru Bishmai, you have Arimim Hashem Kedil Sani V'Samachto Eivayli, which is fascinating. It's fascinating that everybody much later had no clue that that the that Arimim Hashem Kedil Sani was so early. And also scholars who knew what they were doing. It seems that for some reason, this these manuscripts, whether it was from 1490 or from the 1300s, just escaped their attention. Um, also, if you look here, as I, I just went to the next page, you'll notice at the bottom, they still said, during the weekday. This is just one of the things that they said. So clearly, Mizmar Lamed or Mizmar Shir Chanuk Sabayas Ladavid is a very early thing. So we could surmise that the practice of saying it is actually not modern. It's actually medieval. The question is, why in the world uh, did people start saying it? And we actually have no data. We have just absolutely no information. My suspicion is that it was simply a, a local custom, and perhaps we're just lucky uh, that we have it in one of these early Mahsayim from from uh, from Spain, or that it's a local ticket to the Castilian Nusach, and the Castilian Nusach seemed to add it. Why they, they left out Mizmar Sheikh Nukas Vayas David would be forever be a mystery. It could be for the Kabbalistic reasons that there's uh, 91 letters, and so there's a whole there's a whole Kabbalistic system to this to this psalm. Whatever the reason is, this is clearly uh, not a modern edition and goes all the way back to medieval Spain. That's so much for that. Now, in the 17th century, we do have a discussion where the Gra himself, or Elio Mavilna, disputed the legitimacy of adding Mizmar Shechonu Chavayis to the uh, to the Tvila. And he has a very interesting reason. Alpia Kabbalah, the reason why we add our Mim Hashem Kedili Sani at the end of Haidu, is because Kabbalistically, Hodul Hashem Kerebu Shmo effectuates a tikkun of certain netzotos of Asiya. If those, that's the Kabbalistic terminology for it. It's the Gimel Rishayinus of Asiya, which are ascending into Yetzirah, and basically, there's a transition period at the end of the Elam Hasiya in the first part of davening into the Elam Hayitzira of the next part of davening. So Haidu Lashem Kirvishmai is that elevation period where you elevate from Asiya into Yetzira. Therefore, after all of those Nitsotsos, those sparks of holiness were redeemed, you're supposed to say a a psalm thanking God that 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 these nitzaytzais were redeemed. So heli sunny min sha'ol nafshi. Uh, is that right? Sunny min sha'ol nafshi. Chayitani mi yor divar. That you raised up my soul from the pits. This is an allusion to the idea that these holy sparks are getting redeemed, and it's a it's a song of of thanks to God that the 
Nitzayis are getting redeemed at the end of Hodu. That's the Kabbalistic view of it. So says the Gra, um, we should not add this part. And there's two reasons given by his Talmidim. One reason is because they hold that the Rebbe said, or the Rebbe, the Rebbe held is Tircha de Sibura. We don't add things to Psuka de Zemra. It's not part of the original thing. You don't add things. And it's Tircha de Sibura. It's extra stuff. We're not going to say extra stuff. But the other thing they say is that because the Ashkenazi custom is to say, Haidu Lashem Kiro after Baruch Shamar, therefore, the Mizmar Latoda Hariu Lashem Kalaaret, that Mizmar takes the the stance, it takes the place of, it, it takes it, it, the stead of Mizmar uh, Shirchanuk Hizbayis David, and it itself is the Thanksgiving psalm that those Nitzvah Sakadusha were elevated. So Mizmar Latoda will do what our Imim Hashem Kedil was supposed to do, and therefore, in their view, it's completely unnecessary. So anybody who prays in the Minag of the Gra will definitely not say our Mimcha Hashem Kedili Sani. So that, that's the modern development of this of this psalm. Its origins are completely mysterious and possibly Kabbalistic. However, it is its um, development and its canonization into printed Sidurim, especially Ashkenazi Sidurim, didn't happen until the 17th century with some controversy. Let's move on. Oh, oh and the, the Moroccans, by the way, have a wonderful fight about whether or not to say the first Pasuk, Mizmar Shir Chanukah Sabayis Ladavid on Chanukah. They're like, well, it's Chanukah, we should say Mizmar Shir Chanukah Sabayis Ladavid. And some of them are like, no, if you say the first Pasuk, then you're messing up the count of the 91 words. You don't know what you're doing. This is all Kabbalah, yada, 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 yada. It's, 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 if you look at the at the, uh, uh, the Moroccan Minhag Sidurim, you'll see the whole fight over there. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay. The next one is, Mizmar Shir Alokim Yachanein Vevachin Yari Panavi Tanu Sela. This is known as Mizmar HaMenorah or Mizmar Samach Zayin in Tehillim. This one is interesting because this here is another one where everybody assumes that it's added by the Mikubalim. And the truth is, yes, the Arizal was one of those, one of the Mikubalim who recommended saying every day and visualizing it in the shape of a menorah. This is a very special Tehillim because it has seven verses and give me one second. Uh, right. So so this Tehillim has seven psukim um, or eight psukim I should say and 49 letters in the in the in the in the psukim after Lam Natech and Gidot is more sheer. So it's always been associated with Sphira. It's been associated with the menorah. It has seven branches, right? You, if you look at any sitter, you'll see this Mizmor HaMenorah shaped in the in the in the shape of a menorah. Art Scrolls uh, Sephardic sitter, for example, in the front they put the menorah of the of this Labnatzeach of, of Mizmor uh, Samach Zion. So it's a it's a it's a very well known uh, Mizmor, and its Kabbalistic power is associated with Sphira. It's associated with the visualization, which is a type of meditation where you're supposed to, you know, uh, visualize it in your mind's eye. Uh, a very Kabbalistic, well-known uh, Mizmar. How in the world did it end up in Psuket Zimra for the Sephardim? So it seems that because the Arizal, this is a modern development, it would seem that because the Arizal recommended saying it every day, the only place that the Kabbalistic Kabbalistically leans, uh, leaning Jews could put it was at the very end of Sukkot Zimra because they had at, at the very end. I'm sorry of of the first part of Davening because they didn't want to put it in Sukkot Zimra since they didn't feel a right to add anything within Baruch Shamar Yishtaba. So they added it right before Sukkot Zimra after Haidu after Hashem Alach Hashem Alach Hashem Ba'ed. That's where they felt they were possibly allowed to add an extra psalm to the morning liturgy. But that, that's that's why it seems that they that they put it there. It wasn't for a deliberate Kabbalistic purpose that it ended there, that it entered there. It just seems that that was the most uh, logical place since I don't think they believed anyone would have said it at the end of davening. So that's how it ended up there. But what I did discover this time uh, while while researching this, this um, Mizmar is that the Mizmar itself has a much earlier history. Already in the 12th century, Rivelazar HaRekeach, a German, uh, uh, one of the Baliato Safot, one of the, one of the German scholars, he himself wrote a whole safer as to the Kabbalistic power of this Mizmar HaMenorah. And let me share my screen with you. This, there's only one manuscript of this safer ever uh, that's still in existence. How do I do this? Wait a second. 
Okay, for some reason, it's not letting me share my screen properly. Unless I'm, am I already sharing the screen? I don't think so. Hold on. Show all windows. That's what it is. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties. But there's one copy of this Kuntris, so to speak, or this, this um, there's a Kuntris or a, a Safer written by Rebelezer Okeach. And it was found in the Vatican and was published in the year 2001 in the back of a Safer called Drush HaMalbashvat Simtom. If you go to Eitzra uh, Chachma, you'll be able to find this. And I have I have it on the screen here. It's book ID number 145028. So at the back of the Sefer, you have the Sefer written by the, by the Rakiah called Sefer Yiras Kel. And it was published a long time ago, but it was republished in 2001. And at the very beginning, he says some really interesting things that that we just don't have any other Makar for. Makar for. We don't have any other source for. He says... Um, Let's just start with the first paragraph. Uh, he has this uh, tradition that David Amelach would emblazon this, he would etch this uh, psalm into his shield, and when he went to war with his enemies, he would be victorious over his enemies with the power of this Mizmar. He also says, and this is, where is this? Right. Our wise men have said, whoever prays with this mizmar, um, every day, with, this, with the dawn of the sun, not the dawn, the, sun, the, rise of the, the rising of the sun, no evil decree will befall him on that day. It will be considered in front of God as if he lit the, the menorah in the temple. And it's guaranteed that he will be um, a, a uh, what's the word? Uh, someone who, who gets a share in the world to come. And then he specifies where to say it. Whoever says it after Berchus Gohanim in the morning, which in their times was after the Tumid, uh, sorry, right before the Tumid, they would um, also, he would have the same the same promises. You should say it during the Sphira. But then he goes on, then the Rekiah gives a whole liturgy. He says that what you should say before, a whole bunch of Pesukim you should say before you say the Lam Natsayach, you should say the Piyot of Adon Olam. And then after it, he says to say the Hi Hashem uh, Elokeinu Imanu, he's, he says to to do two set two more sections to like uh to bookend the the recital of this Mizmar Hamenora. So already in the 12th century, much earlier than the Arizal, we find a makara a source for people saying Lam Naseach Ben Ginot Mizmar Shir every single day. This is yet another modern addition to the Siddur, which actually has medieval sources, and the connection between the two is probably lost to time. We will never know if the Ashkenazim were saying, but we do know that the Arizal is not responsible for getting it into the Siddur. Everybody assumes that the Arizal, because he recommended saying, saying is responsible for putting it into the Sephardic Siddur. But yet again, we are foiled by the Siddur printed in Naples by the Sansino press in the year 1490. I'm going to share my screen once more for that very same Siddur that we saw before. And if you scroll down just one page, you're going to see that Lamna Seapenginot means Marshir. So the very theory that that it's solely a Kabbalistic um, addition. I'm sorry, am I, I'm sharing the wrong screen, but that's fine. I'm showing you the one from 1524, but it should be here as well. Oh, my bad. It's actually not here in the 1524 version. Let me share a different screen. I'll show you it's in the 1590 version. Uh, share screen. Uh, hold up. Show all windows. Welcome to the world of... Uh, there we go. If you look in the sitter printed in 1490 rather than in the one printed in 1524, right there. Now, it might be that that was only for Shabbat, but the the the, the, the sitter itself doesn't make it clear whether or not it was for Shabbat only. It's one of the, the difficult part about medieval sidurim is that they just don't make it clear. This is an incunabula. It's from like before the 15th century. So again... Not the Arizal's fault. Clearly, this was added to the Siddur before the time of the Arizal. Both the Svardim and the Ashkenazim have an early Makar and an early source for it, but actually the the uh, 
setting it in stone that it's part of the Sephardi Siddur for Kabbalistic reasons only happened much later. Okay. That's so much for Mizmar Samach Zion. So we've already debunked two. We have one, uh, we had Mizmar Lamed, Mizmar, that's Mr. Shir Chanoch Sabayas David, our Mimcha Hashem Kedidasani, which seems to be a modern edition, was always thought of as being a modern edition, but really has its roots in medieval Sidurim. We also have um, the Mizmar Samach Zion, which has its Minhagim originally in the 12th century and also already in the 15th century. This was commonly practiced. Now, once you see something in a sitter from the 15th century, it means that it has been said for a few centuries, or at least, sorry, a few, at the very least, a few decades. Okay. Where do we move on to from here? Okay. So I just, I miss, I put something in my notes in the wrong order. Let me just uh, uh, put it in the wrong place. Okay. So now the first Sukkim of Ashrei. Let's discuss the first Pesukim of Ashrei. Last week, we discussed how in Ashrei, we begin Tehillah L'David with Ashrei Yishin V'secha Oidi Halulucha Selim. Ashrei Yom Shekach Halo Ashrei Yom Shehashem Alokav. And we discussed how this idea of adding these two Pesukim was already uh, noted in the Sidurim and in the Halachic works of the Rishonim, especially the Rishonim from Provence. Now, Earlier, in the time of the Geonim, saying Ashrei was called saying Tehillah Ledavid. They didn't call it Ashrei, they called it Tehillah Ledavid. And my theory was, that I posited last week, was that in northern France, their minog was to add an entire introduction to Tehillah Ledavid, which was a series of psukim which began with the words Ashrei. And that's what, indeed what we find in the Machsar Vitri. Or... The Ashrei Shivasecha that we know today was simply a relic of Yehi Chavod Hashem Olam, and that the Ashrei's were really a part of the Yehi Chavod Hashem litany of Psukim. So it could be a mixture of the two that 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 uh, introduction to the Tila Ladavid was that first of all Yehi Chavod Hashem Olam is itself an introduction to to Tila Ladavid, and the Ashrei introduction was blended with the Yehi Chavod Hashem introduction. Now. In the modern era, meaning once we have printed Sidurim, we find exciting evidence of both psychologies. Let me show you the the Machzorim, or the Sidurim, of the Greek Jews and of the Italian Jews. I'm going to show you side by side what they do. Let's see. I have this in Adobe Reader. Give me a second. It's a little difficult to do this year because I have so many of the, um, so many things open at once. Sorry. Here's the Machsora Romania. This is the Greek, the way the Greek Jews prayed. I'm scrolling here through the through the um Sukkot Zimra. Give me one second. Here we go. In this version, we have Yehi Chavod Hashem Olam. And then at the end of Yehi Chavod, we have Ashri Tmi Me Darach Hahochim Betoras Hashem, Ashri Yoshiv Sechal Dilchazil, Ashem Shekal Hashem Shashem Lokav. And then separately, we have the Mizmar Tilo Ledavid. You could see just from the typesetting in this Greek sitter that they considered Tehillah Ladavid to be a separate section, and that they considered Ashrei Tmi Mederech and Ashrei Shavisech to be a part of Yichvod Hashem Laolam. Likewise, um, sorry, I need to get this out of my way. There we go. Likewise, in the Machzor Roma, we have something very similar. In the Machzor Roma. We also have Yichavod ending with Asher Tmi Mederech. This is the Italian Nusach. And Asher Yishvetecha Odio Lachasel Hashem Shekachal Hashem Shem Shemalakav in a completely separate paragraph. And then it begins Tila Ladavid separately. So it seemed that the Greek and the Italian Jews never called, even in the modern era, never called Ashrei Ashrei. They would call it Tila Ladavid. Now, the final Pusik of Ashrei, which is Vanach Nudavari Ka Me'ata Ve'ad Elam Halaluka, is not part of Tila Ladavid. Vanach nu devarech kam me'atav ad elam haleluka is part of kuf yud uh, kuf yud hey or kuf tes vav of Psalm one fifteen. So how did it end up there? Now over here in the in the Machs Aroma, they give the explanation why vanach nu devarech ka is added to the end of Tila the David, which sounds like that the Italian Jews in the sixteenth century, not all of them were putting vanach nu devarech ka me'atav ad elam haleluka. Not all of them were adding it in the in, in, in the 16th century. So why do they why in this sitter it's it does add it and it gives an excuse for it. 
So this is giving us evidence that the minig of saying Luka wasn't universal in the 16th century, just simply because it has to say why we say it. So let me just, for, exa- for, a, for a second, take a break to explain why we say it. So the earliest makar for saying this is in the Siddur of Amram, uh, and also the Chuvas HaGa'inim, where it says that that we we want to connect Tehillah LeDavid to the Halalukas. We want to do the Shalshule Halaluka Baser Halaluka, to chain the Halalukas one to the other. Now, Shilshul, or Shirshur, or Salsala in Arabic, is a poetic device where you chain the last word of a of a poem with the first word of the next stanza. So every the last word of a stanza is the first word of the next stanza. So the halalukas are clearly a form of shul, of shulshul, or in English there's a fancy word for this, anadiplosis. Uh, don't ask why in English there's a fancy word for everything. So for some reason the Gonim already believed that this was a form of shulshul. Whether or not they believed it was a poetic device or it was a Kabbalistic device is not clear to me. I, I, I seem to lean that they believed it was a mystical device, that it was a Kabbalistic device, and I'll explain why in a second. The Rishonim bring this Messiah that we want to, you, you know, people add Vanachnu Nevari come out to Haleluka, especially the Archos Chaim who lived in Provence. He brings this Minhag. And he says, I don't like it, because why would we add it to every Ashray? According to the Seder of Amram, according to this, this troop of Negayinim, if that's true, you should only put it by the Ashray of, you should only put it by the Ashray of Shachras. You shouldn't put it by the other Ashrays. And this is actually, to be honest, the minog of. Yeah, this is actually, this was a minig in the 16th century. If Chaim Vital mentions this in passing. There were Jews who would only put at the end of, uh, at the end of the Ashrei by Shachris. Fascinating. However, he brings another reason. He says from, I think, Sir Yitzchak Marwan, he says, or he's talking about Juan Halevi. He says the reason is because because Rabbi Yossi says that whoever says Tila Lulavit three times every day is going to be Zaychet Elam Haba. So we say that we should be Zaychet to bless Hashem in Elam Haba. So we end it with Hallelujah. He likes that reason a little bit better. But at the end of the day, the Chaim says three things. He says, first of all, I don't like, he says, first of all, I don't like the Seder of Amram's reason because we should then say it by all three. Why we should. We should not say it by the second two Asher. He says, first of all. Second of all, he says, if you add Vanach Nuvari Kamiyat by the Haluluka, you would have 11 Halalukas instead of 10. You can't have 11 Halalukas. Our Messiah is you have to have 10 Halalukas. It's a special number, probably a mystical reason. We don't want to mess that up. So you shouldn't add the last Pusik. And the Archus Chaim, again, reflecting the meaning of Southern Provence, says, Puk, Puk, uh, Puk, the Chazi Maya Madvar, which is a, basically an Aramaic fancy wor- term of saying, Go look what everybody's doing. Nobody says the last pasuk of, of uh, nobody says Vanachin Bari come out by Haluk at the end of Tila Ladavid. Therefore, it's clear you shouldn't say this pasuk at the end of Tila Ladavid, which is fascinating. If Aaron Milunil was 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 testifying that in southern France, nobody in their right minds would say the la- that that Vanachin Bari come out by Adoylam Haluka to end Ashrei. So, from this, from the minag we're seeing in Provence in the 12th century, we see that it wasn't universal to add that last pasuk. But when we look at the modern uh, Sidurim, both from the 16th century Italy, and if we look at the Shara Kavanot from Rechaim Vital, we see that many Jews, even in the 16th century, were not adding Vanachin Barakame Atavad Olam Haluluka to the end of Tehillah Ledavid. Some of them didn't even call it Ashrei, they just called it to Tehillah Ledavid. Rechaim Vital, however, does say that the Arizal had the Minhag of saying Vanachin Barakame Atavad Olam Haluluka at the end of every Ashrei, not like other people who didn't. And he also said that he did it by all three ashrays every single day. So that's the the uh, the modern development of the words before ashray and the words after ashray. How about the standing by Vavarach David? So Vavarach David, we mentioned last week, we discussed some of the history of how Vavarach David evolved. But why do we stand? So this clearly is a modern invention. This comes from the Arizal. The Arizal says this in Sharak Avanas, and he gives two reasons. The first reason is Vavarach David is a tikkun of the of the of the sphere of Kesar in a, in a, in a way, and Vavarach David as Hashem is Vav Dalit Alf Yud, and then uh, Atu Hashem Alokim is 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 the Rishi Tevas of Alf Hey Yud Hey, and therefore for the whole section which is a tikkun of Kesar you have to stand. That's the Kabbalistic reason. The other reason is that there was a minhag to for the Gabay Tzedakah would go around and collect Tzedakah during Vavarach David. Therefore, since you're doing a mitzvah a mitzvah say of giving Tzedakah, you're supposed to stand. 
And a second and a half reason he gives is that Kabbalistically, you're supposed to stand while giving tzedakah. Not just for the halachic reason, but also Kabbalistically, a person is supposed to stand while giving tzedakah. For this reason, Temanim, who kind of only read the second part of the Shark on us, their minhag is to sit by Vavarach David, because they claim, well, we don't have a minhag of giving tzedakah by Vavarach David, so we sit by Vavarach David. A lot of the Ashkenazim took this all the way, and they said, well, since we're standing by Vavarach by, by, by David, uh, we don't sit until the end of, of Azashir, because there's also another reason to stand by Azashir, so they just stand from by Vavarach David all the way to Yishtabach. That's the history of that. That's clearly a modern invention. At the end of Az Yashir, we say Hashem Imloch Lo'olam Ve'ed twice. This already comes from the time of the Rishonim. And this was because the, the Chazin wanted to put a marker that this is a separate section of Tefillah. In their times, most people didn't pray with Sidurim, so they didn't know when the end of a section was. Therefore, at the end of a section of Davening, they would usually repeat the last verse. Like, Kola Neshama Talaluka Halaluka is the end of the proper verses of Tzuki De Zimra, and therefore they would repeat the last verse. So too, Az Yashir was also repeated. Uh, the, the last verse, Hashem Yimloch Lamed, was also repeated. Now, some of the Rishonim disagreed. You shouldn't repeat it. Why? Because, well, Az Yashir is added for a very deliberate Kabbalistic reason. There's 18 names of Hashem in the Az Yashir, and we're supposed to fulfill all 18 names of Hashem. If you add Hashem Yimloch Lamed, you're, you're messing up the count. I'm simple. I'm simplifying here, really, because it's, it's really from Vayhi Bashmot HaBoker. They have a whole cheshbin that you add Kila Hashem HaMulucha to fill up the last four Shemes Hashem, Shem, Hashem. But technically, the main argument is we don't repeat Hashem HaMulucha Lalam Ba'ed because it's going to mess with the counts of how many Hashem Hashems there are in Az Yashir. The Beis Yosef brings both in, in, in Simon and Aleph uh, Sif Tess, he brings both Shittais and he says, what you probably should do is say Hashem Yimloch Lolam Ba'ed and then repeat it B'targum and then, and then just translate it a second time, say it in Targum. What eventually ended up being the Minog was that people would say it twice and then they would also add the Targum. Why is this the case? Well, probably because, and I, I remember finding a source of this last time, but I couldn't dig it up in time for this year, that Rizal held, and I don't know where to find this again, but he held that anytime you say two Pesukim that are in the Torah itself, like the Pasuk Hashem Yimloch Lolam Ba'ed, that are in Hamisha Chamsha Torah. If you're saying a Pusik twice, you also have to add the word Targum. You also have to add Targum afterwards for some Kabbalistic reason. If you say any Pusik in Torah twice, you have to say the Targum afterwards. Okay, so that's how that developed. And that's really a modern development. If you look at the Sidurim, you'll see the early Sidurim will just say Hashem Yim Loch Lolam Va'ed one time, or some of them will, will add it two times, but they'll never put in the Targum. And the development of saying it twice and then adding Targum is very much a modern development. So lastly, Kivasus Paro. That's the last part of Az Yashir. Uh, that is definitely from the Arizal. No Sidurim that I could find, uh, almost definitely, because none of the Sidurim I could find, whether they're Ashkenaz, whether they're Sephardi, whether they're medieval, early medieval, late medieval, I could not find any Sidur which added Kivasus Paro Bayam. It is directly added in the Sharkavanot in Nusach HaTefila. So the Sephardi Sidurim began adding that, much to the chagrin of other pais came like the Gra, who held, don't put that in because you're messing up the count of the Shem Hashem's in Az Yashir. That's first of all. Second of all, it's not part of the Iker Takan of Tfilah and Estirchat de Sibur. You can't add things that weren't supposed to be in the Tfilah. So the Gra says, don't say Kivasus Paro. Um, Kivasus Paro. And also he says, look, Hashem Yimokhulam Ved is said twice. That's the end of Az Yashir. Incidentally, there's a Machaikis Roshayim if Kivasus Paro is part of the Shir, not as Machaikis Rashi and Nerav Ramin Ben Ezra. And this Machaikis itself is reflected in the views of many Achreinim who discuss whether or not to add Kivasus Paro Bechpov But clearly, adding those Psukim is a Sephardi invention from the 16th century onward. And with that, we have covered, I think, every aspect of the modern development of Psukim de Zimra. And Bezrat Hashem, next week we will continue with Yishtabach, God willing. So thank you everybody for your patience, your endurance. Oof, and we will continue next week.